Welcome all y'all to a reading of Summer and Shiner. This is a book by a guy named Nolan Carson. And actually, he lives on the other side of those woods. Isn't that amazing? And he wrote these books a while back. I believe this was in 1990, 1991, so 30 years ago. But he was writing about a time 50 years before that. And that was the 1940s. He uh, wrote these books and has visited the middle school many times. Some of you may have actually met him. He's the guy who walks around with a snake uh, and that likes to, to nuzzle him. And he wrote this book uh, because his home no longer exists. And he uses his own experiences and puts them all together in a story. And there's a bunch of series with these called the Shiner series. And his hometown is now underwater, literally. If you've ever gone boating by the dam, Total Creek Dam and Total Creek Lake, I don't know if you realized it, but there's a city or town at the bottom of that lake that's been flooded in filled in and there's several towns that were removed and when you read this this is before that dam was put in place that dam was put in the 1950s because of a major flood that happened in manhattan and they're like we got to manage all these manage this water we're just going to keep ruining this city and we need water stored up for recreation and for keeping track of uh, keeping the wildlife and all that stuff so I think it's a great idea to know a little bit about the history of this area, just 20 miles that way. And Summer and Shiner is a great story to read. And if you like them, we have the other ones that you can borrow because there's several sequels. So let me just start reading Summer and Shiner. I might have a little bit of an accent when I read it, and it might go away every now and again, but we'll see. I like to smell that strong catfish smell of the Blue River while I'm sitting and watching the yellow moon in the slow moving water. A body could sit there in the evening listening to the frogs croak and mosquitoes whine around his head to watch the blue fog settle in, coating the Flint Hills. It's great when you got nothing else to do and it's free besides. Back in the late 1940s, my folks were poor. Uh, we're not dirt poor. My dad's a small town grocer who does his best for his family. He isn't a real big man, but he's got a mighty big heart. There's always some poor widow getting an extra two or three ounces of summer sausage without paying for it. The whole lot of farmers have to charge their groceries, many of them keeping it on the tab for a long time. Sometimes it gets so long that Pa transfers it over to Bill's uncollectible. He asks them politely if they could just pay a little now and then, but most of them tell him different things and he always nods his head in understanding. Weed prices are down, some say. We don't even break even these days. Oh, I lost my best milk cow last week, of fodder poisoning. I still got vet bills to pay. Oh, the bottom 80 flooded during those rains last month. Got to plant the whole crop over. Kids got the croup and the missus is feeling poorly. Doctor bills are stacking up. Don't know when I'll be able to pay even just a little much. Much obliged for you carrying me. You'll get your money. Don't worry about that. It just, just takes time. That's all. Those are a lot of excuses that they would give him. And Pa always grinned painful like and let the matter ride for the time being. Pa, Ma, and me live in this little town named Belford, Kansas, after the town founder, Johannes Belford, who settled here in 1874. He got off the boat from Sweden a few months before, and he and his young wife headed west to find a farm and to freely practice their Lutheran religion. They traveled by covered wagon, parting 
with the rest of the wagon train on their way to Oregon when they came upon this hazy blue valley nestled at the foot of the Flint Hills. I heard that Johannes Belford knew at first glance that this is where he wanted to live until he died. The valley was as green as could be and muddy and a muddy old river snaked through it, rimmed with rich sandy loam, ready to produce any kind of farm product from golden wheat to the reddest watermelons known to man. You guys know what loam is? Loam is a type of, is what we call dirt. Like he saw great dirt and there was water, things you need to be a good farmer. And this was uh, 1964, Johannes Belford figured this out. He continues, I'm sure glad Bel I'm sure glad Johannes Belford found this little valley. His discovery gave me a chance to live here. The town never got more than 350 souls, counting every cat and dog alive. It's a lot like being in the country without living in the country. It's an ideal place for boys to grow up. There's Turtle Creek nearby with fat wiggly bullheads. There's Cave Springs, Hidden Valley, and the beautiful Flint Hills to roam around in, letting you pretend to everything from being a great explorer to a swashbuckling pirate. Kids play in the streets way past dark in Belfort. We just don't like to hang around the house much. There's too many exciting things to do. Even when winter comes and the snow drifts six feet high, kids pull on caps with wool flaps, big mackinaws and seven buckle overshoes and play as though there's no snow at all. Our house is smack dab next to the schoolyard. You just have to step off our yard and there you are on the schoolyard. This makes it handy. I can get up five minutes before the bell rings and have no trouble at all getting there on time. But I sort of like school and I generally wait on the concrete steps for Mr. Schaberg to open up so we can play basketball in the gym before class. Even in the summer when school's closed, I'm there with my friends. We get up on the roof of the gym and move a couple of metal bars away from the windows then drop onto the bleachers and play basketball for hours on end. The gang never disturbs anything. We just love to play basketball. We have dribbling contests, free throw contests. We play horse and around the world, games like that. Time seems to ooze by in Belford. We know we're never going to get old. Who thinks about getting old in 12? That's way off. Of course, we don't ask ourselves how old man Hughes got to be as old as he is. We don't dream that there was once a time when he was a kid around 12 or 13. I guess we think he was born with tons of wrinkles, inch thick glasses and bunions. I don't know. I never really think about it much. After nine months of school, I was looking forward to 12 slow moving, lazy weeks of freedom. I had a whole lot of things planned to do. The sun was as hot as our pot-bellied stove after it had been stoked good, stoked good on a winter's night. Did you guys hear that? I'm gonna pause for a second. That's called a simile, right? When you use like or as, it compares the sun was as hot as a pot-bellied stove and full of wood. Like, don't touch it. It's like when I go outside, it feels like that. It's a simile. Paint a picture in your mind and sensation. So you, I don't just say it's hot. You compare it to something. Keeps going. I hippity hopped across the street for fear my bare feet might stick to the road. I had a dollar and some coins in my sweaty hand to buy some material for Ma at the store. I looked up the hill. Belford was built on a hill. They never had to fear about flooding that way. I saw what looked like the wet wavy patches floating in midair. Already I was hot and thirsty and hadn't even gone six blocks. My mouth was set on having a green river at Peterson's Drugs. Ma said that if there was anything left out of the money after buying four yards of material, I could get myself a green river at Peterson's. I figured there should be at least a nickel left if I was lucky. You could buy a pretty nice green river with a nickel. Probably similar to a Mountain Dew. Right? Hip hop a little faster. Just thinking about a nice cold drink and the ceiling fan going around and around over my head. It always seemed cooler there than anywhere else in town. And I really liked the smell of everything mixed together. I could 
smell the ladies' powder and cosmetics, the lemons and limes behind the fountain, and even the new ink on the papers and magazines in the news rack. I loved to leaf through the comics and maybe even buy one. Once the cashier decided to tape them shut because so many kids came in, bought a nickel Green River and a nickel Cola, and spent the whole afternoon reading Captain Marvel, Dick Tracy, Wonder Woman, Superman, and some of the other heroes without buying a single copy. Some of them peeled the tape back. I caught a lot of them doing that. Peterson's finally decided to get the tape. Today, Mom made me wear my shirt. I felt the cotton cloth cling to my back and sweat poured off me. She thought it was proper not to wear, it was not proper to, walk, just to not wear a shirt to town. I knew I'd peel it right off when I got back home again. She never made me wear shoes, though. No kid wore shoes in the summer except to church or fancy affairs like ice cream social rallies. I mopped my brow with my fist, wadded with money, and looked up ahead. My heart sank to the bottom of my feet. There was Mick Fuller and his gang coming towards me. I squinted my eyes in the sun to be sure who was with him. I knew the tall one was Mick because he always carried a staff. Actually, it was just a limb he cut the branches off. But he always carried it. I think he thought it made him look important or something. Frank was with him. You couldn't miss Frank because he was about as wide as he was tall. The fat kind the fat kind of laid over his eyes. Some kids used to laugh and say it was easier to jump over him than walk around him. His face was sweaty and red as a beet. He was trailing Mick as usual, partly because he was so fat he couldn't keep up and partly because Mick didn't like anyone walking in front of him or beside him. He was the leader and he wanted everyone to remember him. Walking back with Frank was Lowell. Lowell was what we used to call an albino. His hair was snow white and his eyes were pale blue, rimmed with pink skin. His eyebrows and eyelashes were so white it looked as though he didn't have any. Clancy and Donder weren't with Mick today. It was just the three of them, Mick, Mick's red chow chow, oh, plus Mick's red chow chow named Devil. That was the meanest looking and meanest acting dog in town. He was bright red and had a mane like a lion. There were a lot of dogs in town carrying scars or limping because of devils. Mick was proud as a peacock over his dog. He knew he could fight like the Dickens and win every fight he got into. Where you going, Bimberg? Going on an errand for mommy? Mick asked, grinning as he approached. Yeah, so what? I hunched my shoulders. Mick stood straddle-legged in my way with Frank and Lowell on either side. I would have had to walk on Mrs. Salberg's marigolds or go into the street to get by them. How about treating me and the boys to a green river at Peterson's? Or better yet, some hard cider down at the pool hall. I knew he was just trying to act tough. I don't have any extra money, I replied. I've got just enough for my ma's material and that's all. I sort of lied because I was still planning on having enough to drink my own. That ain't very neighborly of you, Bimberg, Mick said, nudging his straw hat from his forehead. I looked into Mick's face blotched with about a million freckles. In fact, in some places, they just poured together in big brown patches. His bright red hair was pasted with sweat to his forehead. Can't help it, Mick, I said. I haven't gotten any extra money for anything. Just enough for what Ma sent me for. And I still say that ain't neighborly of you one bit. Right, boys? Frank and Lowell obediently nodded their heads. I knew that Mick had heard the expression from the free picture show on Saturday nights between the burned out walls of the Seawalds and the Citizen Bank. John Wayne used it a lot. What phrase is he talking about here? The, it ain't neighborly, right? That's what he's talking about. And John Wayne, that's an illusion. Whenever you reference somebody who's famous, you guys may not know who John Wayne is. He was a famous cowboy movie actor. He's from Iowa, but he was a famous movie actor who was a, uh, always played a cowboy. 
So he probably said something like, that ain't very neighborly. And the bull, town bully here likes to use that to manipulate people. You know what? Maybe I should sick devil on you. Maybe that would make you act a little more neighborly. I shook my head, starting around him. Devil growled, and his upper lip drew back, exposing a row of sharp white fangs. I acted as though devil didn't bother me one bit, but I felt my heart pound in my chest as I dipped down into the gutter and back up on the sidewalk. Mick turned around, his face red as fire. Bimberg, you just about got your tail bit. You know that? I walked on, acting as though as I hadn't heard a thing that Mickey said. With my eyes on the ground, I silently counted the bricks in front of my feet. Hey, Bimberg, do you hear what I said? I turned around, looking back over my shoulder. Yeah, I heard you. So what? Mick and his boys ran up behind me. My stomach tightened, getting ready for battle. You never knew what Mick had in mind. I tensed, feeling his hand touch my shoulder. Hey, Bimberg, don't go away, man. I just want to talk to you, that's all. I kept right on walking. I felt the damp collar and the wet coins clump together in my fist. Hold up, will you? I stopped and turned to face him. We just thought you might have changed your mind. You've had plenty of time to think about it. I told you that I have just enough money for my ma's material, and that's all. I ain't about to. Nah, Mick said, grinning. That ain't what I wanted to talk about. Right, boys? Frank and Lowell shook their heads. No, I wanted to talk to you about the club. You decided to come on with us or not. You've had long enough time to think about it. It's the best club in town. He offered me his big plug of tobacco. Here, take a chaw. I could show you I'm trying to be friends. It's red man, it's as strong as anything you can buy. That is, if you're man enough to take some chaw. He leaned forward, grinning, letting a liquid line of black spit ooze from his mouth. We looked at each other and laughed. Give me that thing, he said. I wasn't about to let Mick Fuller think I couldn't handle tobacco, even though I got as sick as a dog last year when I experimented with Troop behind his folks' shed. Troop is his friend, right? I bit into the plug, working the tobacco up and down in my mouth. For a moment, my eyes went back in my head and a wave of dizziness swept over me. I jumped to one side, blaming the hot sidewalk for burning my feet. What's the matter? Too strong, Mick said, expertly spitting the juice on the sidewalk before him. No, nah, it ain't that. These bricks are burning my feet, that's all. Oh, that's it, huh? Mick said over his shoulder at Frank and Lowell. Glad you're such an expert at chewing. I was afraid you might get sick or something. Nah, it never did bother me. In fact, I like it. I have it quite a bit at home after supper and during chores, times like that. Sure, I bet, Mick said with a sneer. I stood there facing him eyeball to eyeball. Meanwhile, the tobacco juice ran down my throat feeling more like cactus juice. Let's go, whined Frank. He ain't gonna treat us to no Green River or Coke. He's going to be that way. Let him go. Bimberg always been against us, Mick said, as he ran his hand through Devil's Mane. We've invited him to join the club many times, and he's always turned his nose up at it. Thinks he's too good, I guess. I swallowed some of the tobacco juice, feeling the tears well up in my eyes. It ain't that, Mick. Some of us guys have a club already, you know that. We've never felt like joining any other, that's all. Sure, think you're too good for us. Mitch looked over his shoulder again. Ain't that right, fellas? Frank and Lowell said, yeah, and even Devil growled. We got some of the best stuff you ever saw in our club, Bimberg. Our initiation ain't for crybabies, that's for sure. You gotta be a real man to pass all these tests. He paused and cocked his head to one side. Your club have an initiation? Sure, we've got a real tough one. What do you make them do? Frank called up. See who can knit faster? 
Lil giggled, giggled, tossing his white hair back. Or maybe they make them get a bunch of those dainty little sandwiches. I felt my face getting red again. This time it wasn't the tobacco. I was hot mad. Well, you guys will never know, will you? That's our club and our secret initiation. Everything's our business. And since you're not members, you'll never know our business. Mick threw down his staff, rushed forward and grabbed me by the collar. I heard that sickening sound of cloth tearing and knew Ma would be upset when I got home. Devil came up growling by my leg, by my leg and I felt his drool and his hot breath. You listen to me, smart guy. Nobody talks to Mick Fuller like that. Everybody in town knows I'm tougher than anyone else. You get smart and you'll find your, telf, your teeth laying on the ground. By smart me, you, you start talking like mouthing yourself off at me. I'll knock your teeth out, right? I felt a rush of fear race to the top of my head. Although Mick was a lot of hot air most of the time, he would do just what he said some of the time. And when he got into a fight, anything went. He thought nothing of gouging a guy's eyes or biting ears, kicking shins or elbowing stomachs. I jammed the coins and the bill down in my pocket and pushed his arm back to pretend I wasn't scared. Leave me alone, Mick. This all started when I said I didn't have enough money to buy you guys a drink. Now, I still say I don't have enough money. No matter if y'all ganged up on me and beat me up, I still won't have enough money. But if you want to take me on one by one, I'll fight you right here and I'll prove it. And I took my boxer's stance. Mick looked down at me, his little beady eyes blazing. He was testing me and he knew it and I knew it. Finally, he jerked his hand loose and stepped back laughing. Come on guys, Bimberg ain't worth fooling with. If he wants to take his money and do what his mommy wants, that's his problem. He won't ever get to see our snakeskins or see our mascot. Yeah, Frank and Lowe cried out together. Mick's eyes squinted real tight. Well, you can be sure that it's war between your club and ours, and the spiders will be on top every time. What do you call your part, your club, Bimberg? Frank asked, hiking up a strap on his overalls. Probably. The ladies' afternoon tea party, Lowell said with a snicker. Mick laughed, showing his tobacco-stained teeth. He turned his spit, nearly hitting Devil in the head. The dog reared back and eyed Mick a bit strangely. It's the Mustang, but it's none of your business, I said defensively. Each one looked at the others. I could tell they were trying to think of something funny to say about the name Mustangs, but they couldn't come up with anything. Mick jerked his head to one side as he thought of something. Well, I'll tell you what. I, being president of the Spiders, challenge your club to meet out at Cave Springs to settle all this. He paused and rolled his eyes back in his head and thought, hmm, let's make it tonight at midnight at the foot of Cave Springs Mountain. We'll see who has the best club then. We'll settle all of this. I knew that, I, that you had to watch Mick real careful. You never knew what he had up his sleeve. It could be a trap. I sure wish Troop was here to help me decide, him being my best friend of all and all. Of course, I knew that if I backed down, it would look like me and the rest of the Mustangs were chicken. I had to do it for the clubs on. Another problem would be getting out at that time of night. I knew that Mick could get out any time he wanted. His folks could care less. His pa was usually up at the pool hall. And his ma was too busy taking care of all the mixed brothers and sisters. He always roamed around town late at night with his staff in his hand and devil following at his side. His folks just didn't care. I guess I felt a little sorry for him, even though Mick claimed he was the luckiest kid in town. Being as he's always got to do what he wanted without some parent giving him orders and all. Well, what do you say, Ben Burke? Cat got your tongue or you just chicken? Mick asked in his little sing-song voice. Me and the boys will be there tonight at the bottom of Cave Springs Mountain at midnight. You got yourself a deal. I jabbed a thumb in my chest. Let me worry about that. You just show up 
Oh, wait. Mick looked skeptically at his pals. Sorry. And then back at me. How are you going to get away with it that late? Your old man will know all about it. I jabbed my thumb in my chest and said, you let me worry about that. You just show up there, that's all. Oh, I'll be there, true. I'll be there for sure. Yeah, and Troop will be there too, he says. So Mick studied his pals for a few moments and then looked down at Devil, debating whether there was anything else left to say. Finally, he shrugged and nodded for Frank and Lowell to follow him down the street. Let's go. We'll see if Mr. Big Shot will show up there if he chickens out. We'll just see. Yeah, we'll see, said Frank. Lowell looked at me with his pale blue eyes rimmed in pink skin and shrugged. He didn't say anything. Mick jerked the brim of his hat back down over his eyes and nudged Devil with his staff. Devil jumped and obeyed at once. The three of them went on down the sidewalk, throwing rocks at cats and spitting tobacco juice all over the sidewalk. All right. Uh, we're going to take a little break here. Your job is to consider uh, who do you think you relate with here in this story? Do you feel like you're a part of a club? Do you feel like uh, you feel alone? Like our boy Bimberg here? Uh, do you feel like you're a leader like Mick or a follower like Frank and Lowell? Think about those things. Next thing is, uh, what do you think his, uh, his friend is gonna be like, Bimberg's friend? Yeah, it's Frank and Lowell. Uh, what do you think Troop is going to be like? All right. And, and what else was the other question I had? I don't think I have another question. Right now, I was trying to figure something out is what's his name? but we'll figure that out in a moment. We'll take a look and figure out what is our main character's first name. I don't think it's in the first chapter, all right? Have a good, have a good thought and we'll be back. <laughs> 